Welcome to this week's lecture, and this lecture is for my microorganisms and their human hosts class. Uh, this title, the title of your lecture is uh, Applications of Immune Response. We are going to be talking about types of acquired immunity, vaccines, and, uh, and uh, herd immunity, which is also known as community immunity. Now, I will have some links for you to watch uh, short videos within this lecture, and I will have them on the screen. However, you can't click on those. Just below, there's called a discussion panel or discussion box. So to below this video, you'll find that. You might have to uh, click on see more to see the entire discussion box, but in there, you're going to find the links that'll take you directly to those videos. So you don't have to type them all in. Just, just whenever I ask you to watch the video, look in that discussion and I have them in order of the ones that I want you to watch. Hopefully that makes it easier for you. So here we go. All right, if you do not remember concepts uh, within natural resistance or acquired immunity, uh, please read to update yourself. It's probably a good idea to go ahead and read those pages. And I have those listed for you on the, uh, on the slide. So from your textbook, pages 469 to 470, then 491 to 493, um, read through that. That kind of gives you an introductory to the immune system. And uh, these are things that you would have covered in anatomy and physiology too. And we're going to build upon that a little bit. So looking at the uh, chart here on this slide, we, have, we were talking about immunity and its types. So we can break down immunity into adaptive, and another name for that is called acquired. So adaptive or acquired immunity, sometimes that's also called specific. Or, and then another one is innate immunity. So innate is a kind of an older term for it, and we lump all of our innate immunity into natural resistance. So <clears throat> we're gonna build upon the adaptive or acquired immunity and look at, we, between that one, we have natural and artificial. Okay, so we're gonna learn the, what, what does it mean to be natural for adaptive or acquired immunity? What does it mean to be natural? What does it mean for artificial and the types within? Now types of acquired immunity. So there are two major types of acquired immunity and that is naturally acquired and artificially acquired. So where I want you to look is on the left side of this table. Now naturally acquired immunity. This is acquiring adaptive immunity uh, through normal events like exposure to infectious agents or exposure through the placenta or through breastfeeding. Now the bottom half of this table, artificially acquired immunity. In general, it's acquiring adaptive immunity through immunizations. This can be oral administration or injections. Now, for these oral for the oral administration or injections, for these immunizations, these can be antigens. This can be anti-sera, antitoxin, or preformed antibodies. Now, so those are the two major differences. But for each of those, you can have two versions. You can have active or passive. So where I want you to look is at the top left for naturally acquired and active. Naturally acquired and active, um, what, this, what happens there is that you're naturally exposed to a pathogen, okay? Naturally exposed to that pathogen and as a result, your body, it re, um, your immune system responds by creating memory cells, antibodies, you get cell mediated immunity and, and, and or antibody mediated immunity, okay? Now, moving over to the left, so naturally acquired passive. Naturally acquired passive means that you are acquiring this adaptive immunity, but you're getting it through the breastfeeding, okay? You're getting it through breastfeeding, for example. Now, so that means the mother is making the antibodies and delivering them to the baby via breastfeeding. This can also be via placenta as well. Um, now, those antibodies, those antibodies that are now in that baby, they were not made by the baby, they were made by the mother. And so antibodies, just general antibodies, will last around, uh, last around three weeks, and, but it will be there to protect that infant. 
Okay, so as long as they continue to receive these antibodies from the mother, they still gain some a bit of adaptive or acquired immunity as a result. Okay, bottom half of the table, artificially acquired. So artificially acquired, so I'm looking at the bottom left, and what do we see there? We have healthcare workers introduce antigens in vaccines. Um, and I said this could be oral administration or injection. Um, so this is when you would go get a vaccine, right? You would, and you guys have gotten vaccines before. And the goal of the vaccine is to stimulate antibody-mediated immunity and cell-mediated immunity in your body. So your body is now is now making these in um, in relation to the antigen, right? Or the part of the antigen, or the antisera. Now over on the right, so the bottom right, what do we see? We see someone getting an injection. This is an example of passive artificial acquired immunity. Now, what does that mean? That means that we can actually make some, we can make some what's called monoclonal antibodies in a lab. So these are antibodies that are made very specifically for a particular pathogen. We can take those antibodies and inject it into an individual. Now, that individual's body would not have made those, right? So they're only gonna stick around a, sh a relatively short time, uh, but it's, they're still there to help protect that person. This could be in the form of monoclonal antibodies, and this also could be in the form of antisera. So antisera is kind of a older term, um, but what it is, it's the serum um, that's developed from the liquid portion of someone's blood, which would intentionally, for all intents purposes, have the antibodies there. So it's one way or another, they're getting the antibodies that was developed somewhere else into their body, and now their body is able to uh, fend off that particular pathogen using those antibodies. So that's an example of passive artificially acquired Im Im immunity. Okay, I have a question for you. So the question is, why does active immunity last longer than passive immunity? So I'm already giving you some information. Active immunity lasts longer than passive immunity. And you can think about what you just learned on the previous slide, those particular types, and this is also listed in your textbook. So um, if you're unsure, I want you to look in your textbook. So the question is, why does active immunity last longer than passive immunity? And so ideally, what I would want you to do is put this on pause and then I'll look that up, see if you can answer that question, and then come back and see if you got it right. Okay, so I already told you one thing, that active does last longer than passive, but why is that? All right, so pause me and then try to find the answer, then come back for the answer. Okay, hopefully you did. And here's a good answer. So with active immunity, the body's own lymphocytes respond by producing memory cells. They're going to produce memory T cells and memory B cells that can produce even more specific T cells and antibodies later on. So before we move on to the second part of this answer, this reminds you of cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity. Because with active immunity, what you're doing is you're gonna stimulate one or the other, hopefully both, cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity. With cell-mediated immunity, you get three major types of T cells. You're going to have cytotoxic T cells, you get helper T cells, um, and then you get memory T cells, right? The memory T cells really don't do anything on the first exposure, but we want them to be long lived. And that way, on any subsequent exposure, then those memory T, cell, memory T cells, what they're going to do is they're going to differentiate and proliferate, and they will very quickly differ differentiate into more cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells. Okay, so we get that recognition, that pathogen recognition with those memory cells. With the antibody-mediated immunity, antibody-mediated immunity, what you get is the activation of B cells. 
get activation of B cells and you're going to get, they're gonna differentiate into plasma cells and more memory B cells. Plasma cells give us our antibodies, right? Our very specific antibodies against that pathogen. Then we're also getting memory B cells, right? We memory B cells really don't do anything on the first exposure, but on any subsequent exposure, they're going to recognize and find immediately, uh, immediately differentiate into more plasma cells and memory B cells. And now we have some very quick antibodies made to that pathogen, right? So now comparing that to passive, passive immunity only lasts as long as those transferred antibodies remain. And that's really only a few weeks. Right. Even you can you can um, inject as many monoclonal antibodies as you can into a body, but they're only going to last so long. Right. So after a few weeks, you're going to have to have that other injection. Same thing for breastfeeding. Breastfeeding will only protect that baby for a short period of time as long as those antibodies are still circulating throughout the body, which is eh, typically about three weeks or so. So active immunity. Uh, last longer than passive immunity. Okay, now we're going to expand on acquired immunity um, and talk about vaccines. So what is a vaccine? A vaccine is a preparation of a pathogen or its products used to induce active immunity. All right, so there are two major types of vaccines, attenuated and inactivated, and we're going to learn the differences between these. So first, attenuated, um, the type. Oh, you know what? Before that, attenuated. What does it mean to be attenuated? Um, this particular word means a reduction. So for that, for the very top where I have type, a weakened form of the pathogen and kind of may re replicate in the host. So let me expand on that a little bit. Now, viral and microbes are not used in vaccines because they cause disease. Um, what scientists can do, they can reduce that virulence. They reduce the virulence so that although it's still active, a pathogen is less likely to cause disease. The process of reducing that virulence um, is called attenuation. Okay, it's a common the a common method for um, attenuating viruses. For example, is um, involves raising them for numerous generations in cells which they don't normally replicate well in. And so they lose that ability. They lose the ability to become very infectious. They look the same, but they've lost the ability to become infectious. Um, as viruses adapt to this, it's kind of an inhospitable environment, um, they reduce that ability to produce disease in humans. Nice. Um, scientists will usually reduce virulence in bacteria by culturing them under unusual conditions, kind of the same, or they, they can genetically manipulate that virus. So if they know the code, right, their, their genetic code for that virulence, they can go in and knock that portion out. Okay, they go in and knock that portion out that that bacteria no longer has the genes to code for that particular toxin. It looks the same, kind of acts the same, but it cannot behave the same. Right. So it can't it can't produce that toxin, for example. Um, and so our bodies will be able to recognize it um, given it in a vaccine form. OK, so that's what's meant by attenuated. And that's how attenuation works. Now, this type of vaccine, so on to our table, risk of mutation to virulence. So how often, or what is the risk? So now that we made it non-virulent, looks the same, but it's non-virulent, what's the risk of it going back the way it was? It's very low. So very low, and let's say, you know, we're looking at the run of the math figures, uh, looking at the probability, if it were to, it's really mild. So if it were to gain its virulence, let's say if it was able to gain its virulence back and cause disease in humans, that disease would be nowhere near. It would if they were to have acquired it naturally. Um, but it mutating 
and mutating to have those virulence factors back is extremely rare. Okay, number of doses. How many doses does it take uh, of the vaccine in order to confer immunity? Usually it's a single dose, okay? Um, the risk to the immunocompromised. So does this mean, does, can immunocompromised people get this type? There is very low risk to the immunocompromised. Okay, so immune response. So the immune response, um, which type of um, uh, uh, adaptive or acquired immunity? Um, for this one is... Uh, sorry, <laughs> for this one, the immune response, we get both cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity. And that's what we want, right? We want both. You know, sometimes we get one or the other, and what, maybe sometimes one is stronger than the other, depending on the vaccine, depending on the pathogen, really. Um, we want both, and it seems that the attenuated is really good at stimulating both because we're getting memory B cells and memory T cells. Okay, so duration, how long does it last? So duration, um, how long does it last? It usually lasts, these usually last a long time and we're talking years. Um, rarely do they need boosters and if they do, those boosters come along uh, many years down the road after the, immu um, the immunity has been established. <clears throat> okay, some examples, which are some, um, uh, common vaccines that you would have heard about that are that have attenuated organisms within them. Uh, these are the MMR, and the MMR stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, the chickenpox, rotavirus, polio, and there's two types of polio uh, vaccines, and one's called the Sabin, right, named after the person who developed this type. And so that's the Sabin polio vaccine. Uh, the flu nasal mist. The flu nasal mist is a type of attenuated vaccine as well. Okay, so let's compare attenuated vaccines to inactivated vaccines. So first looking at the type, inactivated. So this includes a few different types. It may include the entire dead infectious agent. Um, the, sometimes you hear it called killed, a killed vaccine, and because you have the entire bacteria or you have the entire virus and it's been killed, right? It's been inactivated in some manner, but the entire agent is there. Or it can include part of the infectious agent. So part of the infectious agent, now how do they decide which part to use in the vaccine? Um, it really has to do with the antigens on the surface. So typically it's a special protein or an antigen or antigens on the surface of that pro on the surface of that infectious agent. It's kind of like their calling card or um, their fingerprint. That's probably better. We don't have calling cards anymore. But, um, but a fingerprint. So it's the it's the molecular fingerprint if you will, of, of that particular pathogen. So it could be a series of antigens that was on the surface, okay? Or this type can be part of a bacterial toxin, right? Because what you've learned so far is that, yeah, bacteria can cause an infection and cause us problems in themselves and being virulent, but a, no, a, whole, a whole other thing is that that bacteria may produce a toxin and your body is reacting to the toxin. So, if it's a toxin, can we include part of that toxin, uh, maybe a special protein associated with that toxin, even like a molecular fingerprint of the toxin into that vaccine, okay? So our bodies, our immune cells will learn what that looks like. So inactivated can include all of those. All right, so let's, we're working our way down the table. Risk of mutation to virulence. So how, what is the risk for these, this type to get their virulence back? Well, if we're looking at what is included, if it's a dead, it's not coming back to life, right? We don't have little zombie um, <laughs> microbes. We don't have zombie microbes, sorry. Um, if it's gonna be a part of an infectious agent or a toxin, 
um, then of course not, right? It's just a part of it. It's their, their molecular fingerprint. I like that. We're going to keep using it. Molecular fingerprint of it. So there is no, there is no risk whatsoever. Okay, so um, number of doses. How many doses does it typically take? And for this type, it, it typically takes multiple doses. Okay, you're going to have to have boosters every so often. Um, and a lot of times with this type of vaccine, they include what is called an adjuvant. So that particular word, word right up there, adjuvant, A-D-J-U-V-A-N-T, adjuvant. Now, what is an adjuvant when we're talking about um, vaccines? This is something that's included into the vaccine preparation that is, is a, kind of like a molecule or a substance that will enhance the immune response. So, because if we're using dead infectious agents, or parts of infectious agent, you know, uh, part of a bacterial toxin, um, and we want to stimulate cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity, sometimes it needs a little bit of help. And those ad adjuvants add a little bit of help. And it's a type of substance, a type of molecule that will help stimulate the uh, acquired immunity. For example, in some of them are very small doses of aluminum. So very, very small dose of aluminum goes into that. What we do know is that when given together, it will help to boost your immunity, right? So it, <clears throat> that's just one example, and they're called adjuvants. Okay, risk to immunocompromised. The risk to immunocompromised individuals is really absent. There is no risk because absolutely not. If you're looking at a dead um, or killed infectious agent um, or a part of, they cannot replicate. They, they, they absolutely cannot replicate. So there is no risk, right? It's not low. It's, there is no risk whatsoever. All right. Immune response. So cell mediated is low. So that means specific T cells, right? Uh, and the, but the a AMI, which is antibody mediated immunity, is good. So we are going to stimulate some plasma cells and some antibodies as a result. And it's kind of it's going to be a little hit or miss on the cell mediated immunity. Okay. In a perfect world, we would get both equally and both would be strong. But depending on the pathogen, really. And when we're comparing the types of vaccines, since these are going to be dead and they're going to be parts of, then we're going to have a little bit lower immune response because of that. Okay, so how long does it last? And you probably figured this out with the, um, with the number of doses, is that it's going to be short term. So what, what does short term mean, right? What, McNew, what does short term mean? And that's, it's relevant. So it depends on the pathogen, okay? It depends on the individual. Uh, for example, our tetanus shots. Um, our tetanus shots, they will last about 10 years, okay? So we know that we need to have a booster about every 10 years or so. So it's all gonna be a little bit different, but it, we do know that they don't confer long lasting, uh, lifelong immunity. Okay, um, some examples. So some examples, we have DTAP. You may have heard of that one. There's a few different varieties of that one. <clears throat> diphtheria, what it stands for is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Um, there's another one, the HPV. I'm sure you've heard of HPV, and that is um, human papillomavirus. There are many, many types of human papillomaviruses, um, and this particular uh, vaccine will help protect you from uh, certain pathogenic types. Okay, rabies is another type. Rabies is another um, type of inactivated vaccine. Um, and it has to do with, um, well, rabies is another type of vaccine, I'm sorry. And what's covered, you can't really see, is the flu injection. So the, if you're getting the flu shot each year, do you get it by injection? It's this type, inactivated. Now, while I have you here uh, in talking about the flu and vaccines, 
Uh, some people don't like to get the flu vaccine. Some people don't like to get vaccines at all. That's a whole different story. But um, what I commonly and often hear is that certain individuals don't like to get the flu vaccine or they get it and they complain because they got sick. Has that ever happened to you? That you got the flu vaccine and gotten sick? The shot? It may have. Um, but this, so that, that really deters people from getting the vaccine uh, the next year, or of course, right? Why, why would you do something that's, you're gonna get sick from it anyway. Um, they don't feel well after. Um, so here's the thing, when I get my flu shot, uh, I don't feel good either. I don't feel good, it takes about two days. I, I, I run a low grade fever, I don't feel good. Um, I start to get, you know, I mean, you know what I mean. I just don't feel good for about two days, probably because of that fever. And then I have a, somewhat a headache or body ache. Um, it, but it's not, not enough to make me lay in bed like I have the flu, but it just I just don't feel good. Okay, now what's going on? It's not that, and I said that this is a type of inactivated vaccine. So take a look again, what we said. It was coming from an uh, entire dead a virus right viruses aren't live but you know what i mean inactivated um or part of the infectious agent we're just going for all um and that is what was injected into you right this molecular fingerprint of what what this is is injected into you so your body's going to react to it now you guys know all about the immune system and you know about the uh innate immunity, right, which we call natural resistance, and the components within natural resistance. Um, can, you, can you guys name some of those components of natural resistance? What's included in it? You probably remember inflammation and fever, right? Okay, so let's think about this. We have, uh, uh, for, we have a pathogen in the form of an injection, and it's, now it's be our body, our cells of the immune system, our cells are being alerted that there's an intruder, something that looks like an intruder, and it's going to stimulate our natural resistance. Our natural resistance includes things like inflammation, it includes things like fever, right? And so your body is reacting to this as, and a pathogen has just gotten into your body. But a pathogen really hasn't gotten into your body, per se, right? Nothing that can cause an infection. But your body is reacting to it. So when I get the flu shot, my body is reacting to that molecular fingerprint. And so I'm getting this natural resistance to that. So I can experience things like some inflammation. I can experience um, some fever because of it. I just don't feel good because of that natural resistance. Now, what's happening in the background that I can't really feel is that it's stimulating my acquired immunity. So my T cells have been alerted, the B cells have been alerted, and my cell mediated may be low, right? We're still getting some of it, um, but antibody mediated immunity, we're making lots of plasma cells and B cells and the memory. So we're banking on that memory T cells and memory B cells to be made. That way, if I'm ever exposed to the real deal, right, they will be able to recognize it and take it out before I am even, I even know that I've been exposed to it. This table shows the effectiveness of universal immunization in the United States. So what we're looking at is the disease and cases per year before immunization. So if, let's just taking a look at some of these um, smallpox <clears throat> and uh, in, in parentheses, you see the years that the, that the data was taken. Uh, so smallpox early in the la uh, turn of the last, last century um, was about 48,000. Um, and once we had a good vaccine for that, uh, the decrease after immunization, 100%, okay? Now diphtheria, diphtheria is a particular disease that we get vaccinations for, that you get one of your childhood vaccinations. 
and um, quite a few people were afflicted with diphtheria um, and were nearly at 100% after that Im immunization schedule started. Uh, pertussis, pertussis are, known, are also known as whooping cough, um, and we've been able to almost eliminate whoop pertussis. Now, with some of these diseases, what we've learned is that we do need some boosters for them. So, as a as a whole, you as a as a whole, um, our immunity, uh, and I'm specifically mean our memory cells, our memory cells will will wane over time. That means the older that we get, the fewer and fewer of these cells that we have. The fewer memory cells, B cells and T cells that we have, um, and they may even go away. So we will need boosters. We need boosters in order to get those memory cells up and active and where they need to be. So pertussis, yes, there we need boosters for, for these as well. Tetanus, we need boosters for. Now, recommended immunizations, the CDC and medical associations publish what's known as a recommended <clears throat> immunization schedule for children, adults, and special populations. Uh, special populations mean things like uh, healthcare workers, which in their job are exposed to a lot more things than the normal individual or someone who doesn't work in healthcare, um, and also HIV positive individuals who we know that are uh, highly at risk uh, for um, susceptible diseases. The recommendations are frequently modified to reflect changes in the relationship between pathogens and the human population. Um, so you will see things like an immunization schedule, recommended immunization schedules for these groups of populations. Um, now, um, how do I say this? I guess there's other types of vaccines that we can get that aren't on that schedule. So vaccines against, let's say, anthrax or cholera or plague, uh, tuberculosis, um, and other diseases are available. However, the CDC does not recommend them for the general US population. The, the chances of us um, actually be, um, succumbing to those are pretty low, so they don't put them on the regular schedule. Now, speaking of vaccines, so you learned about the types. You learned all those lovely facts about the vaccines and how they're different, how they work, and what to expect in the human host. Now, when we talk about vaccines, there are many uh, myths that go along with vaccines. Um, and it, it's really important to know what those myths are and also what the facts are concerning those myths. So um, up on your screen, I put up some of those. We're going to talk about a few of those. So if we look at the myth, the myth that vaccines cause autism, um, we look at the facts, the studies that have been done, there is no evidence um, of a link between the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine or any other vaccine um, to autism or autistic disorders. Uh, the, another myth is that many people who were not immunized in the past uh, led long, healthy lives. Thus, there's really no need for vac vaccines. Um, you know, my my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, grandfather never had vaccines, and they lived to be a hundred years old. They did just fine. They just they did just fine. And that I'm happy that they did just fine. However, when we look at the facts, even though vaccine preventable diseases can be mild in some cases. Uh, it's better to be protected as you can, you'll never know how severe a particular disease is going to be in the body. So there are pros and cons to different vaccines, right? And really the, the pros really win out when we're talking about infectious disease. Um, Here's another one that we hear quite often is that it's better to be immunized through disease rather than through vaccines. So for us, because we're learning about this specifically today, is that through naturally acquired. So 
basically what that's saying is it's better to have naturally acquired diseases rather than artificially or naturally acquired immunity rather than artificially acquired immunity. Okay. So that means we should let you get sick with the chicken pox and gain immunity through that instead of getting you the vaccine, which you gain immunity from. Well, the facts are that the price that you pay for immunity through natural infection might be extremely high, right? And it may cost you your life. Uh, if it doesn't cost you your life, you may have lo long life, lifelong sequela as a result of that. Okay, so it may, may be have, have devastating effects on a family if you don't, if they happen to live through that. Um, then again, the pros and cons, right? The pros and cons of that. Um, wouldn't you rather have a vaccine that is going to stimulate that immunity rather than you can become sick from it? Maybe you get the mild disease, but maybe your parent doesn't. Right? Maybe you'd accidentally transmit it to your parent and your parent doesn't have that mild disease. Okay, you put others at risk because of that. Now let's talk about herd immunity. Another term for this is called community immunity, but it's a mouthful for me to say. So older term, herd immunity. Newer term that you're gonna start hearing more of is called community immunity. All right, so what is it? Um, it's basically indirect protection from infectious disease when the critical immunization threshold has been met. Okay, what is critical immunization threshold? That is when a certain portion of the population is vaccinated or has natural immunity, then it will actually protect others in the population from the disease. Okay, so either you got a vaccine and you developed the memory from it, or you had got it naturally and you have the memory for it. And what it's going to do, it's going to protect others in the population from that disease. Pretty wild. So how, how does it do this? It does that by limiting contact. So it limits the contact, therefore potential transmission, of susceptible individuals with those who are carrying or sick with the disease. If we have less people out in the population who are sick with it or carrying it and don't know it, asymptomatic carriers, still either way, you can still spread those diseases around. If we have less of those people and more people who are immune to it, then that's gonna protect others. So for example, the herd immunity critical threshold for mumps was thought to be about 85, 85%. Okay, so if we could, if we, if if 85% of a population either had natural immunity to it or immunity from the vaccine, okay, we're hoping immunity from the vaccine, um, then the likelihood of coming into contact front with someone who is sick from it or who is an asymptomatic carrier is so low that it actually prevents the other people from getting it. But a study in April of 2017 showed that it needs to be really closer to 96. So a lot higher than what we thought it was. So now we, need, now we know that years down the line, years and years down the line, we may need a booster for that. Okay, so we may need a booster for that because we will see the Im overall immunity start to wane over time, right? But we, we do know that that critical immunization threshold needs to be higher. What do we know about measles? So measles, we are still having outbreaks of measles um, because not a whole lot of people, but because the uh, critical immunization, immunization threshold um, is between 93 and 95%. But when we look at the, the population, the population of people getting immunized from measles is dropping, right? So when that drops, then what happens is that critical immunization, immunization threshold has not been reached and therefore there will be no herd immunity. Now I like these images 
that I'm showing you because they're color coded, right? Um, visual, so I like to see those colors. But let me explain to you what's going on. This is a good way to visualize herd immunity. So if we look at the top picture, and we're looking at the blue people, okay? So what does the blue represent? The blue represents um, people who are not, haven't been immunized, um, but are still healthy, right? They're still relatively healthy. Okay, so what happens? What happens when just two, two individuals who are not immunized and got sick and are now contagious with a, an infectious disease? So out within that population, what happens is that because it is contagious, it's gonna start spreading from person to person. Spreading out from those just two individuals and because no one has been immunized, a lot of people get sick. So the contagious disease spreads through the population. Many people get sick. Many people get sick and therefore are contagious themselves in order to spread it around. We're kind of experiencing that right now, okay? We didn't have a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, right? But we know it's highly contagious. And so we're kind of in the red, on the red part right there, right? So not immunized, sick, and contagious. We have many people in the population, okay? Now it's not gonna hit everyone, right? We still have some blue people up there, not immunized, but still stay healthy. Okay, so that's what's gonna happen when we have the critical immunization threshold has not been met, right? So no herd immunity. Now let's look at the bottom picture. So now we have immunized but healthy individuals and those are in yellow. So if we can get a large portion of people to get immunized, we can reach that critical immuniz immunization threshold for whatever infectious agent that it is. And we have some, we're going, always going to have some blue people. What are the blue people again? They are the, they're not immunized, but they're still healthy. They're out there in that population. And what happens when we have sick and contagious people? Those are in the red, right? So the likelihood of them coming into contact with the blue individuals become lower. So if most of the people in the population get immunized, right, we, we increase the, the, the numbers of people who got immunized, therefore people who will not become sick with it, then the spread of that contagious disease is contained. Right, we can contain that and we can actually protect others who were not um, immunized. Okay, so I have a short video for you to watch. It's called Vaccines and Herd Immunity. It's a short video. Remember, you don't have to write this down. Just write below in the discussion box. There's a link there. Just open up that discussion box, click it, and then I will see you on the next slide. Now immunity, immunity will wane over time. You've heard me say that a couple times so far. So what do I mean by wane? Um, waxing and waning. So comparing those two. Like McNew, we're not talking about phases of the moon. What, why, are you, why are you even saying that? So, but waxing means increasing, right? Waning means decreasing. So immunity will wane over time as you get grow older. So remember, what do we really mean by that? Memory cells are going to decrease in numbers over time. So many people will need those boosters because of that. <clears throat> now, um, vaccines. I said that they protect others. So how in the world does me, how, how does it that, that I take um, vaccines, I get vaccines, and how does that protect others? Well, there's groups of people that it protects. If we can hit herd immunity, if we can reach that critical immunization threshold and 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 hit and reach that herd immunity, well, okay, you you meet the critical immunization threshold, which initiates herd immunity. That's how that plays. So, but herd immunity protects four groups of people. Okay, so you're protecting four groups of people. Okay, number one is people who received the vaccination but no long-term immunity. Let me explain that one a little bit. Now, if you get a vaccine, every individual is different. You may not have stimulated, it may not have stimulated cell-mediated 
or antibody mediated, or maybe it did just a little, but just not enough. Okay, we don't know that. We don't know for sure unless you have a blood test done and run a titer test. Okay, we hope that that works, but we know because of probability that there's going to be some that's not going to work. Okay, uh, as or as well as we want it to. Okay, so people who receive the vaccine, vaccine and for whatever reason, no long-term immunity sets in. Okay, that's one group of people. Number two, immunocompromised individuals who cannot receive vaccines. So immunocompromised, we've talked about that before. I think you know what that means. Um, this, would, and this would include people like the elderly, okay, cancer patients, um, these are, they, they will be um, considered immunocompromised, people who have other types of disorders, okay? If you have another type of disorder, you are immunocompromised. You could be immunocompromised. And, and it may not be recommended that you receive these vaccines because of that. Okay, number three, unvaccinated individuals. So whatever reason, Maybe their parents wouldn't allow them to get vaccinated. Maybe they don't, well, they're, they're just not vaccinated, unvaccinated individuals. Another group, number four, is babies too young for vaccines. So typically you have to be a certain age uh, of an infant in order to receive vaccines. Can you still get those diseases? Absolutely. But babies have to be a certain age in order to get vaccines. So you're all, so this is another group, babies too young to receive those vaccines. So if it protects all four of those groups, we're, meet, we're reaching that critical immunization threshold, which induces herd immunity. We're protecting all of these other people, groups of people. Um, how? how? How is it exactly doing that? And it's doing that because that infectious agent would not be able to spread. It would not be able to spread, be transmitted, not because there's not enough susceptible individuals. The likelihood of it coming into contact with, with infected individuals is going to be really low. Okay? So think about that picture that I showed you with the colors, right? The likelihood of coming into contact with infected individuals is going to be super low. So therefore, it protects these people from, from um, that infectious disease. So me getting vaccinated, right, protects others, not just myself, right? You don't get vaccinated because you only want to protect yourself. You get vaccinated because you're also protecting all of these other people, right? Maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a grandmother, grandfather, father and you have infants, then you need to make sure that you have the immunity to those particular diseases because what happens if you come into contact with an asymptomatic carrier, okay? And it gets transmitted to you. You become sick with it. And it might be mild for you, but you may transmit that to your baby unintentionally, and it may be a life-threatening situation for your baby. Okay, about one third of all deaths worldwide is attributed to infectious disease. That's quite a bit. And, you know, according to McNew, um, probably is that the surveillance, the testing and surveillance, therefore surveillance of infectious disease isn't where I would like it to be. Um, so, you know, that's just our estimate based on the testing that is done and the surveillance as a result. Actually, the number is probably higher than that because of it. Now, talking to people. As a, as a whole, uh, scientists, doctors, and other types of healthcare providers don't do a really good job at talking to the general public. Okay, um, I, I'm pretty blunt when I talk, but um, it, in talking to the general public, sometimes certain aspects get kind of fumbled. Now, I don't, and I don't mean fumbled, really. 
Um, so for example, there's a lot of talk out there on uh, SARS-CoV-2 and herd immunity. Someone asked me a question about that the other day. And in the explanation, I started talking about, you know, the critical immunization threshold and what that needs to be and how that, how it's not going to get there um, it, under the circumstances that they were talking about. And then after, you know, I, I commented, um, I'm like, oh, should I really have cleared all of that? Did, did they really learn about her immunity? Because I, for me, I felt like I had to include that particular aspect of it. But, at, you know, as a whole, we need a better way to talk to the general public. Um, and I'm not good at it either. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you straight up. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, can, I can tell you all about it. Right? So, and, and, and for me to, to convey information, as you can probably figure this one out, I had to get into a lot of detail. So, I'm, I'm more of a detail-oriented type of person, where in order for me to, uh, to, to explain something to you, we got to learn about those little details. Because in my mind, without those details, nothing else makes sense. However, when you're talking to the general public, and especially when we're talking, I'm going to kind of shift this to vaccines. When you're talking about vaccines to people, I can talk all day about statistics. Um, I can talk about the pros and cons, um, myths and facts, the scientific information, right? I love, I love to talk about it. Of course, you guys know that. Um, but there's a large percentage of people out there that do that are afraid of vaccines for whatever reason. And they decide not to get vaccinated and they decide not to get their children vaccinated and as a result we're starting to see more and more of um, outbreaks of what was once or still very deadly diseases and have in the past caused widespread outbreaks um, and even pandemics worldwide and they are still refusing to get vaccines so we as a whole and i'm including you is that we have got to get better at talking to people, talking to people about their health, their body, and advantages of taking care of themselves and in different ways in which we take care of ourselves and therefore um, society as a whole, okay? So I'm kind of throwing this back on to you. You guys are, are my health um, ambassadors. You guys are my health ambassadors. And you guys are going to be the ones on the front lines. Um, no matter what your major is, right, what profession that you have, you're all interested in health care in some manner, right, in some manner of the term. Um, but you're going to be dealing with the public. And so we have to find better ways in which to convey accurate scientific information to where we can better help the individual with their health and therefore the health of the population as a whole um, against these infectious diseases. So I would like you to watch this video and we're kind of going out on, on this video. Uh, I think it's about 12 or 13 minutes. It is a, a TED Talk. It's an example of a TED Talk and I, I know you've heard of those before. And I want you to watch this and then that will be the end of our uh, lecture for today.